The question occurs on the amendment. All those in, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. The bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I will begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. H.R. 3884, the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act of 2019, or the Moore Act of 2019, this bill would make three important changes to federal law. It would, one, remove marijuana or cannabis from the list of federally controlled substances. Two, authorize the provision of resources funded by an excise tax on marijuana products to address the needs of communities that have been most seriously impacted by the war on drugs, including increasing the participation of minority communities in the burgeoning cannabis market. And three, provide for the expungement of federal marijuana convictions and arrests. I have long believed that the criminalization of marijuana has been a mistake. Marijuana is, the oldest, is one of the oldest agricultural commodities not grown for food, and it has been used medicinally all over the world since at least 2700 BC. But its criminalization is a relatively recent phenomenon, as a treatment for a multitude of ailments, including muscle spasms, headaches, cramps, asthma, and diabetes. Today would be a highly priced drug it was only in the early part of the 20th century that marijuana began to be criminalized in the United States, mainly because of misinformation and hysteria, based at least in part on racially biased stereotypes connecting marijuana use and minorities, particularly African Americans and Latinos. The Moore Act would remove marijuana from Schedule I, and as a result would decriminalize it at the federal level, leaving it to states to regulate marijuana at the state level as they may choose. The Moore Act would address some of these negative impacts by establishing an opportunity trust fund within the Department of the Treasury to fund programs within the Department of Justice and the Small Business Administration to empower communities of color and those, mostly ad adverse, and those most adversely impacted by the war on drugs. These programs would provide services to individuals, including job training, reentry services, and substance use treatment, would provide funds for loans to assist small businesses that are owned and controlled by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals, and would provide resources for programs that minimize barriers to marijuana licensing and employment for individuals most adversely impacted by the war on drugs. The collateral consequences of a conviction for marijuana possession, and even sometimes for a mere arrest, can be devastating. For those saddled with a criminal conviction, it can be difficult or impossible to vote, to obtain educational loans, to get a job, to maintain a professional license, to secure housing, to receive government assistance, or even to adopt a child. These exclusions create an often permanent second-class status for millions of Americans. This is unacceptable and counterproductive, especially in light of the disproportionate impact that enforcement of marijuana laws have had on communities of color. The Moore Act recognizes this and addresses these harmful effects by expunging and sealing federal convictions and arrests for marijuana offenses. 67% of Americans now back marijuana legalization, up from 62% in Pew's 2018 poll. In my view, applying criminal penalties with their attendant collateral consequences for marijuana offenses is unjust and harmful to our society. The Moore Act comprehensively addresses this injustice, and I urge all of my colleagues to support this bill today. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I don't approve of marijuana, and I believe that, above all, it needs to be kept out of the hands of children. There is considerable evidence that it can cause permanent neurological damage to developing brains. I also believe it does no good for society, but that's true of a lot of things I don't approve of, but that shouldn't be illegal. I'm a stamp collecting, for instance. I support legalization not because I support marijuana use, but because I believe our laws have done far more harm than good. They've created a violent underground market, which has in turn become a breeding ground for spin-off crimes. Criminal convictions of young adults for merely satisfying their curiosity have ruined countless lives. And far from keeping marijuana out of the hands of young people, I believe it's done exactly the opposite. A deputy sheriff once observed that if he picked two high school students at random, gave them each $20, uh, told one to go out and buy booze and the other one to go out and buy pot, the first one back would always be the one he sent to buy pot. They know where to get it and the seller has no compunction to selling it to them. 
Uh, the one he sends to buy booze would go to one liquor store after another, get carted, and get kicked out. So I don't sing the praises of marijuana. I simply recognize the limitation of our laws and also the uh, limits on my ability to try to run everybody's life for them. We have a societal obligation to keep the stuff out of the hands of young people, advise everyone of the risks associated with it, and then to respect the right of grown-ups to make up their own minds and lead their own lives as they see fit. So I support most of the provisions of the bill. Mr. Chairman, uh, what this amendment does is strictly uh, add in, uh, and I commend you for making sure that we have restorative justice as a part of this bill. Uh, but what this amendment does is allow uh, the funds to address any collateral consequences that individuals or communities face as, the, as a result on the war of drugs. Uh, for those of us that were in those communities when the failed war on drugs started, we know the damage that was done, and we know that the many collateral consequences that people face because of it. So uh, the bill allows you to address uh, any consequences for individuals, and we're just adding in uh, individuals and communities that would um, face challenges as a result of the uh, war on drugs, and that's simply what it does. Will the gentleman yield? Uh, for example, mentorship programs, because one of the collateral consequences of the war on drugs was that so many African-American men were taken out of their communities, and you had so many children that didn't have a male father figure. So you could talk about male mentorship programs, you could talk about uh, recreation programs, you can talk about a bunch of job training. You can talk about a bunch of things that were uh, the effect of the intrusive war on drugs and the effects specifically in urban communities around the country. So if they can show that uh, it's a community program that also um, touches on some of those collateral consequences, and that's just one of many, by the way. A lot of them are educational. Uh, and I'll give Two seconds to, uh, I mean, I'll yield to Karen Bass so that she can. Insert. Thank you. A couple of other collateral uh, consequences would be the children that were removed from their mothers because the mothers were incarcerated. The people who went into jail and didn't receive drug treatment, and when they get out, they still need drug treatment. So the collateral damage uh, is really extensive. So I'll thank the gentleman for his amendment, but I simply want to make uh, one point. Uh, the massive incarceration post the just say no is evident. Uh, and even though we've been working very hard to diminish the impacts of massive incarceration in this committee, I would say the collateral damage is evident uh, by the extensive numbers of minorities that have been incarcerated on the basis of drug possession in small amounts. I yield back to the gentleman, thank him for his amendment. I say that um, uh, I, this is a very helpful amendment. I thank the gentleman for offering it. I urge my colleagues uh, to support it, I yield back. Does anyone else seek recognition on the amendment? Uh, the gentleman from uh, Georgia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, I appreciate the gentleman's amendment. I, I, his heart in this area is, is evident and well thought, and I appreciate his concern here. I think I have a, just a bigger issue in going back to discussing this, is we're talking about, and I think the gentleman from Florida raised a very valid question on this bill. It's, it's a broad scoping bill. It changes a lot of things. And here's an interesting point just for those in the audience. I am not opposed to looking at ways that we can change this. The question I have here, though, is, is this bill specifically has never had a hearing. This bill specifically has never been discussed except in broad sweeping strokes in a hearing that we had earlier this year on marijuana policy. And I understand that. But for many people going forward, if we're to actually make real change, and actually make change in marijuana policy, actually look at it from its medical benefits, from its recreational benefits, anything else we want to do, is we've got to actually have a discussion because for 70 plus, 80 plus years, the American public has been told one thing about marijuana, bad. It's hard to change companions and minds over a simple bill right now. This is not simple. It has a lot of moving parts. It has a lot of different areas. And so for many of us here, the question is, is do we want to accomplish something or do we want to simply make a political statement? I agree that we need to work on this, but this is not fair to be putting a bill together we've never had a hearing on specifically. These questions, like the gentleman from Florida raised, could have been asked. We could have included it in the uh, base text of this bill that the gentleman from Louisiana brought, which I think is, a, is, is fine. That's what our priority is. We just disagree. But my question is, is do we want to accomplish something or do we simply want to make a political statement? 
A political statement is a bill that can't become law, okay? This is coming from a state trooper's kid who, you know, grew up with the fact you don't get close to it, you don't touch it, it was against the law. But I am trying to at least train myself to say, okay, what is the other side here because I have not heard the other side. I didn't, was not raised in this and our state does not accept this California and others a legalization process. So why come in here today with not a hearing on the bill itself and try to change this many years of social injustice and everything else, which I am not denying. But you're also trying to move a mountain that is going to take a lot more. If we want true change, then educate the public. Educate the people on what this bill could actually do or not do. And then have an honest give and take back and forth. Instead, we're taking a lot. And I respect the chairman for wanting to go for it all the week before Thanksgiving. Is anyone, uh, who's, uh, the gentlelady from uh, <coughs> Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I want to... Uh, support this amendment from Mr. Richmond. I think it's an important amendment, um, and I want to speak to the underlying bill as well. Um, this bill is really getting us to a whole new level, and I want to thank, I see Barbara Lee in, our, in the audience, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, thank you for your leadership as well for so many years. Um, I understand our ranking members' points, but I would just say that there are a lot of people across this country that have understood this issue for a very long time from a number of different perspectives, some because our states have moved in that direction, some because our communities have suffered from the consequences of the failed war on drugs. And so while I understand that not everybody is there, I also think that our job in Congress is to make the case as we bring these bills forward. Perhaps not everything passes into law the first time. Um, I, think, I think the ranking member certainly knows that even from music modernization and how many years it took to do that. But I think the reality here is that we, we do have a crisis that we're digging out of for many of our individuals in our communities. And that is what the Moore Act is about. It is um, our, uh, our work to decriminalize cannabis and empower states to make their own policies. And it's about taking that important step forward to undo some of the devastating impacts of the war on drugs, particularly for young people of color. And so I am grateful to the chairman for introducing and championing this bill, which I think is historic. Our legalization in Washington has been a huge success. Let me tell you about it. Washington now has 505 retailers creating new small business opportunities. Retailers have a 91% compliance rate, higher than that of alcohol retailers. The licensed cannabis industry has generated over $1.1 billion in tax revenue for the state, and youth cannabis youth, uh, use has remained steady. Um, so the people of Washington made this bold choice because we recognized that the war on drugs was a failure. Folks of color were bearing the brunt of that failure, but across the board, we were criminalizing something that should not be criminalized. Despite the overwhelming success of Washington's legalization efforts, the problem is that we still have a lot of things that need to be fixed in order for us to be fully successful in our efforts, and this is true across the country with different states. Um, we need this bill, we need the MORE Act, because despite our overwhelming success, licensed cannabis retailers do not have access to the banking industry and are thus unable to accept credit cards, deposit revenue into a bank account, or write checks. It creates a burden, particularly for small businesses, and it means that legitimate licensed businesses are essentially acting as cash-only businesses. That is a major public safety risk, and it creates a very weird, perverse opportunity for money laundering, tax evasion, and other white-collar crimes. The Moore Act fixes this problem, and it aligns federal and state cannabis law and allows for safe banking for legitimate cannabis businesses. So the tides have turned in a very short period of time. Now 47 states have legalized cannabis to some degree. This is a remarkable education of the public since, 19, uh, since 2012. And uh, obviously we need to continue to do more, but this has been a remarkable turning of the tide. But Congress has fallen behind the national trend. And it is now time for us to take action and address that gap between federal and state laws. And this important bill does just that by removing cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act, thus decriminalizing the substance at the federal level and allowing for states to set their own policies. The lady yields back for what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? I like the last word. The gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, just to go back to the point we're rushing into this, this is 
a big deal. And, you know, I, I, since I've been here, I recall uh, apparently, I believe it was in the 80s, uh, the Judiciary Committee went rushing into an effort to be some more severe on crack cocaine than powder cocaine. And uh, many important members of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, I think somebody from the caucus said, if, if um, you don't make these penalties against crack cocaine much more severe, then you will, that you obviously don't care about minority communities because this poison is destroying our communities. And so there wasn't as much need apparently to, to get real good testimony on the, uh, from experts on what that would do. So we saw decades where minority communities were, were really unfairly treated by the overzealousness of punishment against crack cocaine compared to powder cocaine. And I'm concerned we're about to do the same thing. We're rushing in. It will be very popular in the moment with people that right. are here. But regardless, this should not be rushed into. There, there's just too many important aspects to this. Uh, we ought to be having people, some here seem very interested. We ought to hear from people that how, how the current laws have affected but I just think it would be very important before we start this war against the war on drugs. Thank you. I just want to make uh, two what? points um, on this. Number one, this country has been debating and considering uh, marijuana for many, many years. Uh, as a member of the New York State Assembly in 1977, I voted for a successful bill to decriminalize marijuana. How many years ago was that? 1977. We've been discussing it ever since. And second of all, this is a basically conservative bill. It's a states' rights bill. It says the Federal government gets out of the business and leaves it up to the states. States can regulate it as they see fit, and the federal government will leave it to them. I thank the thank gentleman much, for yielding. Sir. I yield back to him. And I appreciate that, but it's still we. There's a lot that's happened in 42 years. A lot more information, and a lot more information about the effects of marijuana that hadn't been previously known. I think it'd be a better idea to hear from experts instead of ourselves. And I, I don't know if the speaker. Didn't, had, didn't have enough faith in Democrats on this committee or too much faith in Republicans, but we need to get jurisdiction back to impeachment. Yep. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, the idea that this committee or the United States of America and the Congress and the Senate are rushing reform on marijuana is ludicrous. We are so far behind. We don't need a bunch of experts to come tell us what we know what they're going to tell us. If they're from the drug enforcement agencies and law enforcement, they're going to say it's awful. If they're normal citizens with an ounce of understanding of what the effects of this drug have been, as distinguished from alcohol and tobacco, they'll say make it like alcohol and legalize it, leave it up to the states. The idea that marijuana should be in Schedule One where it can't be researched, where you can't research it and then learn maybe something about it, which is part of our problem, is ludicrous. It's in a class with heroin, psilocybin, acid, meth, qualudes, <coughs> ecstasy. That's what's in a class with. It doesn't belong. Which one doesn't fit? Marijuana. Schedule one is supposed to be no recognized medical use. We know it helps people with glaucoma, with PTSD, with appetite disorder, people with multiple sclerosis, PTSD veterans, chemo, cancer, relieves nausea. We know that. So it doesn't fit that class. And a high degree of likelihood of abuse. We don't see a whole lot of people hung out on the streets trying to get a joint to keep their habit going. It doesn't happen. So the fact that we get it descheduled doesn't need any great experts. And even if you were the, the son of a deputy sheriff, you know that's horse manure. And the fact that we should leave it to the states to get the federal government out of it 
our federal drug enforcement people need to be working on meth and crack and heroin, serious drugs that do cause people to get addicted, to lose their lives, and to steal to get the money to buy their drugs, and not to be dealing with marijuana, which the only thing they get out of that is they get to claim some of the person who's selling its assets and then feed their own empire. We need to move forward and pass marijuana reform. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the chairman for bringing this good bill forward. I intend to vote for it, the more bill, but I fear that to get something done, we may need a little less uh, than more. Nonetheless, I, I do appreciate the challenge that is presented in legislating around this issue. I, I have to remark, though, to my dear friend and mentor from Texas's comment that he feels we may be rushing into marijuana reform. I have never heard the marijuana reform movement accused of rushing to anything. Uh, and I would also suggest that having 47 states innovate around this policy space and improve the lives of people, we are not rushing. We are being dragged forward by our constituents and by the states that are filling a void as a consequence of a failure at the federal level. Uh, and I think that failure is demonstrated across a variety of spectrums. First, the prohibition on research. And I'm grateful that the legislation the chairman's brought forward will democratize access to research by removing marijuana from the list of uh, Schedule 1 I just drugs. wanted to quickly address the issue of rushing into this issue. California was the first state in the union to legalize medical marijuana back in 1998. And we know medical marijuana is good for seizures, glaucoma, and other sorts of things. Uh, uh, our veterans in my home state, home to the greatest number of veterans in the union, uh, are telling me we want cannabis, we prefer cannabis, cannabis to opioids. So I've approached the VA, I've asked the VA, please do research into what cannabis is good for, and what cannabis is not good for. And the only thing I get from the VA is, we're not gonna do it, federal law. Federal law essentially has barred additional research into cannabis. It's time we change that situation. Back when I was in the state senate in California, I worked with public safety, let me repeat that, I worked with public safety hand in hand, along with the cannabis industry, to move forward a sensible regulatory framework to address cannabis, to make sure that cannabis was kept away from our kids, to make sure that folks did not medicate and drive, and to make sure that each time a patient was going to medicate with cannabis, that that medication was properly labeled. There's currently many agencies across the federal government who are very familiar with regula regulating products like cannabis, such as alcohol and prescription drugs. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm simply a mother. I will always be a mother. And so I'm going to speak to you from a mother's heart today with my remarks. I know that we're still really learning about the health and safety and therapeutic, therapeutic questions that surround the use of marijuana. And I'm proud to represent many scientists and researchers, medical professionals, uh, all that are in my district, the Center uh, for Disease Control, the CDC, and the experts that we need to answer some of these questions to know how best to regulate marijuana going forward. Federal regulations of marijuana has severely limited researchers who uh, could otherwise find the answers to these important questions that we're asking today. And I have to say simply, I am voting in support of the MORE Act so that we can answer these questions. Those con consequences um, our young people face from marijuana use can depend far too much on the color of their skin. We live in a system where some are given the opportunity to move on from their mistakes, maybe a single day of suspension from school, no driving privileges or no allowance, but for other families, families that look like mine, those mistakes can become something that labels their teen as a criminal or a convict. And the mistake becomes something that takes that teen away from school for months or even sometimes years. The MORE Act restores some justice to our criminal justice system. By removing marijuana from the Controlled Substances Act and creating opportunities for expungement and resentencing, 
we help people get the opportunity to move on with their lives and to become productive, collaborative members of our communities once again. Uh, I'm a little puzzled by the majority, or the minority party's uh, arguments against moving forward today with this. After all, last session when they were in the majority, did they hold those hearings on this urgent issue? Uh, did they try to move legislation to reform our marijuana laws? Uh, I wasn't here, but I have a feeling the answer is no. So there's no rush. Uh, in fact, we're decades late. The studies, the research, the damage is known. Uh, communities of color have disproportionately uh, been damaged, destroyed, delayed in what they can do economically, educationally, and in every other way. Since the war on drugs began, the nation's prison population increased from 300,000 people to a staggering 2.2 million people behind bars. In the decade between 2001 and 2010, 8.2 million people were arrested on marijuana charges. Nearly 90% of those arrests were for possession, possession only. Most troubling is the fact that despite equal usage rates, black Americans are now four times more likely than white Americans to be arrested for marijuana. People of color have disproportionately borne the burdens of these draconian policies, facing longer prison sentences and a lifetime of economic consequences of having a criminal record. As my colleague uh, from Georgia so eloquently stated, think of the, indif the difference and the injustice between what might happen to one of my three sons and what would happen to her own. We can right that injustice. We can correct past wrongs. The MORE Act uh, is more than just a marijuana bill. It's a sweeping effort to bring equity to our criminal justice system. By removing marijuana from the Controlled Substances Act and requiring federal courts to expunge prior convictions, this bill will go a long way to, expunge, to reduce the racial disparities that plague our criminal justice system. Uh, it is these marijuana laws that are feeding people into that system. And so this must come to an end. Uh, we cannot continue this way. And so I'm happy to support the MORE Act, uh, which uh, is going to decriminalize, uh, or excuse me, take uh, marijuana off of uh, Schedule One, where it resides with drugs like heroin and cocaine. Uh, this is ridiculous. It needs to stop. Too many lives have been uh, lost to unfair jail times, decades of probation, uh, all for selling or possessing uh, marijuana. And with that, I'll yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Richard. Move strike, last word. It was recognized. I want to speak in favor, Mr. Chairman, of the Marijuana Opportunity and Reinvestment and Expungement Act of 2019 and in favor of the excellent Richmond <laughs> Amendment. Um, several of our colleagues have said that we shouldn't be rushing in. I think from the standpoint of the vast majority of people in America, we're hardly rushing in. We're really decades late uh, at this point. Uh, there are 600,000 marijuana arrests every year. Millions of people's lives have been affected by marijuana prohibition, which has proven to be a disaster at every so, level. Far from rushing in, we are catching up with the rest of the country as represented by uh, state and local legislation from all over America. 46% of all drug prosecutions are for marijuana possession. Um, so we know that hundreds of thousands of people's lives continue to be affected uh, by these retrograde laws. Our colleague from Wisconsin invites us to engage in legislation that will bring the country together. That's precisely what this will do. More than two thirds of Americans, 68% of Americans favor the legalization of cannabis and an end to the war on marijuana. Um, and here, the people have been following very carefully uh, our own constitutional history because, you know, we had alcohol prohibition with the 18th Amendment to the Constitution. That proved to be a complete disaster for our country as it corrupted the police forces, it corrupted the judiciary, it just drove the price of liquor sky high. Uh, it essentially built organized crime in America. And it has been the same uh, with marijuana. It has ruined a lot of people's lives. It has corrupted a lot of law enforcement in different 
parts of the country, and it's essentially put the government at war with the people. Uh, we repealed marijuana, uh, we repealed liquor prohibition in the 21st Amendment, and we should repeal marijuana prohibition today. We should uh, end this disastrous experiment. Now, alcohol has both costs and benefits to it, and we didn't repeal the prohibition of liquor because liquor is always great. It's not, but it's got to be dealt with in a serious public policy manner and as a public health issue rather than as a question of criminal law enforcement and big brother. Um, marijuana prohibition is costing Americans billions of dollars a year in failed and futile uh, and counterproductive enforcement efforts. If we legalize it, if we regulate it, if we develop sound public health and public welfare policies towards marijuana, we can actually make millions of dollars uh, in the taxation of, we can make billions of dollars in the taxation of marijuana and we can improve public health and public safety at the same time. I, I do have to say it is surprising to hear some of our colleagues say that we should be having uh, a set of more hearings about this when the GOP was in control of this committee in the last session of Congress. There were no hearings about it and I remember uh, working very hard with our colleague, Mr. Gates from Florida, to demand hearings about it, and no hearings were forthcoming. The time for inaction is over. The time for excuses is over. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm glad that you're approving that we are able to ferret out high crimes and misdemeanors and criminality at the highest levels of government at the same moment that we make progress on the important public policy problems of the day. And on the other side, we simply get naysaying, nothing can happen, nothing can work, obstructionism at every turn. So, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back just saying I am glad that we are moving forward, and I hope that we will move quickly to bring this to the floor. I want to thank the Chairman for his leadership uh, on moving this important legislation forward and certainly uh, rise in support of the amendment by my colleague, the gentleman from Louisiana, uh, as it relates to attempting to deal with some of the collateral consequences of overcriminalization in America, particularly in the marijuana context. The failed war on drugs here in America has its origins, of course, in 1971, when Richard Nixon publicly declared drug abuse public enemy number one. Historical records now indicate that, in part, uh, that war on drugs was directed intentionally at communities of color. We also know that the origins of marijuana prohibition policy that date back to the 1930s also have its origins in targeting unnecessarily and viciously communities of color. We know when the failed war on drugs was first launched, there were less than 350,000 people incarcerated in America. Today, there are 2.2 million. Disproportionately black and Latino, disproportionately from low-income communities of every race across the country, urban America and rural America. It's a stain on American society that we incarcerate more people per capita than any other country in the world, including China and Russia combined. In the last Congress, thanks to leadership from this committee led by Doug Collins, we were able to take an important step forward in addressing our mass incarceration problem, our overcriminalization problem that exists here in America. This is another step forward, particularly when you consider that the out of control policy that it relates to marijuana is really not limited to any one particular jurisdiction. We were troubled that in the last decade, New York City became the marijuana arrest capital of the world. Progressive, left-leaning New York City. And we know, based on statistics, that while marijuana use is equally divided amongst people of every race and every socioeconomic status, and in fact, there have been some studies that suggest that whites use marijuana at equal or greater numbers in many instances than do communities of color, black and Latino communities. In New York City, 80% of the arrests for possession of low-level 
quantities of marijuana were in black and Latino communities. And it leads us to ask the question, either marijuana use is socially acceptable behavior or it's worthy of criminal prosecution. But it can't be socially acceptable behavior in some communities that tend to be more affluent regardless of race and criminal in other communities that tend to be predominantly black and Latino all across the country and in New York City. And so it's very important for the federal government to send a different message as it relates to marijuana. And that's exactly what's being done in this particular instance by descheduling it because it never belonged in schedule one and is the fruit of a poisonous tree but also making sure that we take steps to repair the damage that was done in every community as a result of the failed war on drugs in urban America, suburban America, ex-urban America, and in rural America as well. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for your leadership and urge all of my colleagues to support this legislation as another step forward in striking a blow against overcriminalization in America. The question occurs on the amendment. All those in all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted.